Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Let's Talk podcast once again. And if you are wondering why am I not able to see the video part because we always record a video podcast, it's because I am not in my home or a studio. So I'm somewhere else. Where, so where am I? As you know, uh, most of uh, the people who are following me on LinkedIn. Uh, today, me and my colleague Mark Samos had a wonderful, I mean, we were supposed to have a, a session, which we had, and uh, so many people turned out around 40 in number, I guess, and uh, and there were many people who couldn't even get into the room. I saw people who were trying to get in, saw a full house, and and went back. So we thought maybe we can uh, record our reflections, our feedback on the session. Not only it will help us to find some insights and recap those insights, what uh, uh, all the attendees provided, but it also helps to those people who haven't attended and they can also get some benefit out of it. So that being uh, said, uh, said, uh, said, sorry, <laughs> long day, I guess. Uh, let's get started. So, who is Mark Simos? Mark? Who, me? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my name is Mark Simos. I'm lead cybersecurity architect at Microsoft. Built a lot of um, cybersecurity guidance um, around uh, things like the Microsoft Cybersecurity Reference Architecture, CISO Workshop, and a bunch of other things under the uh, Security Adoption Framework umbrella. And, you know, uh, wrote the first book of the series, of the Zero Trust Playbook series, um, uh, contribute to and uh, author some of the open group standards on Zero Trust, so I tend to stay pretty busy. <laughs> That's great, and, and uh, thank you for uh, co-presenting and, and give me some insights about uh, how exactly these sessions are uh, being conducted from your perspective as well. So let, let's get started. So initially we had a couple of questions which was pretty, uh, we were surprised to find, and specifically around multi-factor authentication. Would you provide some reflection on uh, what was one of the positive uh, surprise for you or anything when we get started? Yeah, so um, we, we kind of set this up and we had a really good two-way conversation. And so we started out, you know, by um, setting the stage a bit and then asking folks, you know, so like where are you on these sort of, you know, main, if you're not doing these, please do these type of uh, security controls. And it was kind of funny, like we started with, uh, with the things that we saw the most popularity for and then we saw it kind of dwindle off, right? Yeah. And the first one, we were very pleasantly surprised with uh, MFA not just for admins, but also for users. We had almost all of the, the 30, 40 some folks in the room raise their hands for that. Um, so most of them actually do have MFA for users, which is fantastic, such good news. Um, you know, as we got into, okay, is you, do you have a separate admin account versus a uh, user account, you know, for doing email and whatnot, you know, kind of dwindled down to a little bit around half or so, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, of course, when we got to how, how are you doing for separating the workstations in the pause or privilege access workstations, you know, it was getting uh, down to only a couple of folks that were, uh, that had worked with that or tried that. And so um, it was very interesting, but it helped mm -hmm. us kind of zero in on, you know, where are the uh, the challenges we see in the market now we know that this is a security session at an M365 conference so you know there's a self selection bias in there for the folks that um, you know that that went and sought out our yes. section to try and get better at security they're probably very much more likely to have done a lot of the security controls like MFA um, mm -hmm. but it was still very very heartening to see that kind of strong response there on that super important control. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I was also pleasantly surprised uh, back in the day when I used to be in front of uh, the customers or take those sessions and ask about uh, MFA. Only handful of people would be like, yeah, we are doing it. But it was like required across the board, which is kind of a win of all the security advocates out here because they always mention that this is one of the uh, first 
I would say, one of the first way to secure, and one of the, I would say, relatively easier way to secure uh, your users, your credentials, and your organization in that perspective. Uh, so that being said, uh, only half of uh, these people mentioned about the account separation part of it. So would you like to uh, dig deeper about what ac account separation we discussed and, and, and what was the feedback you sensed? Yeah, absolutely. So the the thing that the thing that we found that's really important is, you know, ultimately the the difference between an attack where the attacker gets an admin privilege versus an attack where the adversary does not when they're stuck with just user privileges. Uh, the effects of it, the impact, the pain level, the recovery work, um, the difficulty of investigation, all of those things are night and day different. Mm -hmm. um, if the adversary is only kept to user accounts and they're contained at that level and you're able to clean them up, it's a much easier cleanup um, and it's much harder for the adversary to get to their goals. Um, there are plenty of things that they can do as user, forwarding emails, gathering intelligence from those mailboxes, etc. Um, but uh, ultimately, the, the amount of work and uh, the me, the amount of damage that they can do as an adversary without admins is much, much less than if they get admin privileges and then they can operate across almost any user, any device, any server, etc. So it's, it's really, really important to keep those adversaries out of the admin credentials. And that, that takes two different forms. Um, one is making sure that your user and uh, admin um, accounts are separate and they're distinct and you're only doing email and browsing, et cetera, on your user account so that your admin credentials aren't exposed in that way. Um, but there's also the need, and, and this, this ended up having a nice long discussion, mm -hmm. around pause or having a separate workstation. Because if I can take over your workstation as an attacker, I can steal every credential on it. I can steal every file on it. I can steal every uh, bit of memory on it You know, as, as I get admin rights of that local machine. And that includes accounts and credentials and all sorts of other things. And so if you've got a, an operating system that has admin credentials in it that can be stolen, then it's it's a bad day. And so we really mm -hmm. want to have a separate operating system that is uh, dedicated to administrative work and that is secure. And so that's really where the PAW comes from. So what is PAW? So a PAW is a privilege access workstation. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's a separate uh, operating system. And, uh, and this really takes two forms, right, when it comes into reality of what are your experiences. Is one, you have two different pieces of hardware, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have a machine A that I do all my email and all those kind of things on, and machine B, which is where I do admin work and no email and no uh, browsing and none of mm -hmm. that sort of high risk stuff that the adversaries have so many tools to get you with, right? And so that's 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 the first option is separate physical hardware. And of course, it's a little inconvenient, right? Like it's, yeah. it's painful, it's challenging, um, it costs money, um, and so it's it's definitely um, one of the challenging ones. Now we did there is a way of having this on a single piece of hardware, mm -hmm. um, but it's not the way people normally think because most people think oh jump box. And there was quite a few folks in, in our audience today that were mm -hmm. you know going down that road, and that that is a little bit better, mm -hmm. right? To have that a little bit. Of separation but the, the reality that we found is that most of the adversaries can take a session if you're going as a regular user and then you decide to up your credentials and up your privileges to an admin jump box or VM or what have you um, they can follow that path hmm. right because if they can take over that user OS they can take every keystroke every bit of memory every session that you're using in memory they really have full control of that machine and so um, and so it's really important to, if you do a single hardware version of a PAW, that that actual underlying OS is the admin OS, mm -hmm. and then you your VMs and you know whether it's local, whether it's a Windows 365 or Azure Virtual Desktop, that is where your user stuff is. That's where your email. That's where your um, uh, browsing and all that kind of stuff happens not on the admin operating system. And so those are really the two choices. You separate, separate, separate the hardware physically, mm -hmm. or you have a single admin hardware that then has access to a user session, which is in a safe sandbox. Because mm -hmm. you just you can't do it the other way around uh, and, 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 and expect that the adversaries won't be able to follow you. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think uh, what we have seen nearly maybe uh, one max a person in the room mentioned that they have implemented privilege access workstation and I think uh, that also tells like they are still a gap 
either awareness or the budget uh, on the on that front. So, what do you think? I mean, so there's a two part of this question. Mm-hmm. Why there is uh, there's a hesitation, or do you think it's a lack of awareness of how that is the first? And the second thing is how people can get the information from where if you know the links to understand like what PAW is about? Yeah, I think I think it's a mix. Um, mm-hmm. Because a lot of folks, you know, just accept the common, you know, sort of wisdom of the past, which mm-hmm. is no longer valid, that, hey, a jump box is, is the next step up. And it is the next step up. It's just yeah. not as high of a step as you thought it was. And so there's definitely sort of an awareness challenge, but then there's also, okay, you know, what do I do challenge, right? Because in all major changes, you need a why, what, and how. Why would I even bother doing something different? What do you want me to do differently? And then how would I do it? And so I think the challenges are kind of spread across all those. Mm -hmm. And so we did talk about and showed some of the the, the securing privilege access guidance and the poly guidance that we provide and explain that. And that was definitely news to a number of uh, folks. Some of them were aware of it, but I think a lot of them were not. Yes. Okay. And what about the uh, PAW? Where do they get more information about Privilege Access Workstation? Uh, it's a simple AKMS URL. So it's ak.ms slash PAW or PAW, mm-hmm. um, which is part of our overall Securing Privilege Access Guidance, which is also AKMS slash SPA or SPA. So not quite a day at the SPA, but you know, same <laughs> word. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think uh, uh, based on the interest... Uh, and we have a pretty, I would say, comprehensive guide mm-hmm. of step by step of how exactly you can implement this and what are the key decisions to take. Because again, strategy is pretty important. Yep. Uh, it's not like this you have to click these buttons and you enable power. No. Uh, what are the repercussions if you do not do it properly? What are the things you have to take care of it? So everything uh, is there in 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 that uh, interim link. steps, different levels. Yes. Yep, all those. Yeah. And then uh, we also uh, discuss uh, something about the exposure management and uh, cloud security posture management and all uh, would you like to kind of uh, shed some light uh, what kind of discussion was it and how we exactly end up uh, in the exposure management conversation yeah it was there was a bunch of really good questions again it was a very interactive discussion yeah. and a number of them sort of led into that hey how do we you know help stop these attacks how do we work in you know, what I term left of bang right mm-hmm. you know sort of the preventing stuff before it happens you know with right of bang being the manage the things that do happen, the sort of SOC space or SecOps space that with the, the bad news you'd have to manage. Um, and so there's quite a few questions around that. And so we got a chance to, to talk about the exposure management capability that Microsoft announced, um, I believe, in March of this year. Uh, which just covered the, um, uh, is essentially what this is, is in many ways it's sort of like what uh, what XDR is doing for right of bank, right? Where it brings together a whole lot of different um, prevention techniques and visibility and reporting and, and whatnot and, and helps you get a view into what is my exposure, what is the risk that I face. And then, you know, I can focus on some initiatives for this particular attacker group or this particular uh, security standard or zero trust is one of the initiatives. Like, how do I, you know, then score myself and rank myself on those particular things? And, you know, and I can have my teams focus on, hey, let's bring our score up in this area and let's focus on our score here. And um, and of course, it's going to benefit usually multiple different areas, because if you're working on something for an attack group, it's usually going to increase your compliance score and vice versa. Um, but it really helps you kind of uh, focus your efforts and get that view across identity and cloud and all these other endpoints and different resources and, and pull it together and really have that kind of end-to-end comprehensive view on preventing attacks. Oh, yeah. And I think that's uh, such a big relief because uh, that, that is something which has been asked by the customers multiple times uh, in previous years as well. How do we have a comprehensive dashboard or kind of looking into, because there are so many, uh, back in the day, if you recall, we have uh, each products in different silos and then we have to take some findings of one product, put it in somewhere else. And uh, and in security, time is, is, is the essence. So we really have to work through to make sure that we have a right storytelling and follow the the breadcrumbs. So how exactly this exposure management, I think, is different from 
the threat and vulnerability management what we had or uh, in now Defender for Cloud we have? Is it a merger of both the, these things or uh, if you kind of give, give some clarity on that? Yeah, it's think of it as sort of like the single pane of glass for that purpose would be okay. sort of the way to put it because single pane of glass for everything is just never going to work because it's, yes. a, it's, a, it's a Swiss Army knife with like 300 attachments, <laughs> right? It's, it yes. doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but having a, a single pane of glass for a particular purpose that brings together multiple data streams, data feeds, et cetera, that's really what exposure management does. Just like the Defender console on the right of bank side brings together alerts and whatnot from Sentinel as well as from all the different Defender for Identity, Endpoint, Office, et cetera, et cetera. This is essentially doing the same with the preventive data mm-hmm. um, on the left of bank side. So you have it for your cloud resources in Azure and on-prem and AWS and GCP, as well as for your identities, for your endpoints, um, uh, for, for um, all of your office configurations and whatnot. And so it really brings all that together into one place with that theme of, okay, my preventive things, the, the configurations, the lack of a patch, all those types of things, mm. really kind of coming together and saying, I need to to, to, to drive this effect across all my technology and how do I do that and how am I doing on it so that I can follow up with the right teams. Perfect. That's great. Yep. So uh, if anyone would like to know more about exposure management, uh, maybe they can just type in Microsoft 365 exposure management, what exactly the keyword they should be looking yeah, at? Yeah, it's actually in the uh, in the Defender portal. Um, okay. So the, the Defender portal people that, that are uh, that are there, it's mm-hmm. um, it's now in as a public preview. Okay. And so you can go ahead and check that out. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's pretty much already there. So lots of folks are already trying it out, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. And we're really looking forward to seeing uh, that, uh, that risk go down. Perfect. Uh, the other questions, uh, so one of the questions which has been asked was about the budgetary constraints they mentioned that we go to the board member uh, or board members or CFOs or now and ask for the budget for enhancing the security posture and most of the time it's not been entertained what do you think why exactly uh, is the question aren't CFOs or any C-level executive aware of the gravity of the situation of these breaches or what do you think about going on uh, in this scenario? It's a really good question. I, I think th- I think the answer is it varies and it depends, mm-hmm. like any important question, of yeah. course. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, I think some of the some of the leaders and, and C suite folks across you know industries, organization sizes, etc. I think some of them aren't are really aware of security. Mm-hmm. Some of them are, but they don't. But they may still believe that hey, it doesn't affect us. Mm-hmm. Some of them may be very concerned, and I, I think. I mean, the way I look at this whole issue in total is, you know, the, the way that people think about risk is in arrears. It's they mm-hmm. think about the risk they've experienced in the past. And so if they have gone through a breach, that's obviously a very real, very emotional experience, right? If, uh, if their peers, um, you know, whether the, whether, whether the breach happened at, at, at their current organization mm-hmm. or a past one, um, but, you know, if they've seen peers that go through it and who've re- related, people they know and trust that have gone through this and said, wow, dude, this is bad, mm-hmm. right? Um, those kind of things kind of make it real. If there's um, financial information that basically describes this is what happened to this organization, there's, you know, there was a bunch of different uh, great ideas that came up that kind of describe that. But I think the, the core underlying theme is how do you make it feel real mm-hmm. to the people in that role? How do you speak? their language so that they understand it in their own terms, not here's a bunch of tech gobbledygook and some big numbers that the tech people think is important, but I have no idea what it means, right? You don't want to have that effect on it. You want to make sure that you're communicating in the language of that person and that organization that they're a part of. And that's, that's, that's sort of the tips that all kind of fit that theme. Um, and sometimes it's insurance, right? If, yeah. if they've got cyber insurance and look, you can bring your premium down and it actually costs you less to prevent it than it does to deal with the, and even the insurance costs of a breach. Mm. Yeah, that's going to get people's attention. Now, some organizations don't have insurance and even, haven't even put that on their budgets. So that won't work, right? But it's about making it real in the terms that matter to that organization and that person specifically, you know, that, that decider or those deciders in, this, in, in many cases. Yeah, I I think that's well said. And that is the way I think every security leader has to follow through, understand uh, 
that what exactly the sea level I mean, you have to talk in their language, and that's where some of the things called empathy also comes into the picture. Oh, yeah. Right? If you are an expert, you cannot think that the whole world around you are expert, and they understand why exactly certain things are necessary. And one of the things I would say I also learn is that you have to understand what are the KPIs of your business and start working on those as well. Uh, try to understand that if we, if you ask for a budget, then try to articulate in a way that how exactly adding this additional cost can save some other other costs which are maybe recurring like the capex or the opex part of the house so you have to really articulate it uh, well in the way that uh, the c level people can understand uh, to take it forward and i think one of the gentlemen also mentioned on a lighter uh, note that they got a breach and now everything is being approved <laughs> <laughs> so that is the unfortunate part of of that, yeah, sometimes breach happens and a lot of things, uh, uh, I would say, expedited in a yeah. way that uh, the approvals comes in, but you don't have to wait for that, and that's where the security leaders comes, uh, uh, the articulation power, yes. Yeah, and then, like, one other last thought on that one is just, you know, sometimes security budget isn't that hard to get, yeah. and so, like, once you get it, though, there's sort of a... You know, it's it's the old with great power comes great responsibility kind of thing that, you know, you got to make sure that you're then spending that security budget on things that have an effect. And then you're continuing to communicate the status and the effects and the returns on that investment. You know, and it's not going to be returns in money. It's going to be returns in you know, security assurances and things got better because and these metrics improved because. But you got to express those returns on those investments and continue to give status on, hey, this money is doing good work. Mm. And here's and again, it's got to be in the language of the people you're reporting to. Um, mm. So it's super critical to, to kind of keep that in mind to, help, to, to make security real and kind of build that bridge between security and the business and IT. Yes, exactly. So let's get on to the, I think, one of the last questions uh, which has been asked about the AI governance. And this is uh, uh, this question also uh, won uh, your signed book as well. <laughs> so the people who are listening, uh, as Mark mentioned in the in the beginning, that he has recently, his uh, recent book is out, and that is Zero, Zero Trust uh, Playbook. Yep. Yes, uh, Zero Trust uh, Playbook, and it's uh, available on Amazon? It is indeed. Okay, perfect. So uh, so what was that question is about the AI governance. And this question is being circulating a lot on, on C-level as well. I talked to a lot of leaders that they are talking about before adopting AI, uh, how the data security governance, hygiene comes into the picture, uh, data spillover, a leak, and a lot of things around that. And obviously, we do not have the answers right now. But I would like to know that how exactly we navigated that question uh, to make sure that the discussion is open. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a AI has introduced a whole new window on everything tech and everything security and often everything business and job related in general. And so it's it's a sort of unexpected dimension of the digital transformation that hit all at once uh, uh, everywhere. And so there's a lot of questions that are unanswered at this point in time, but there are quite a few things that we do know we have to do, and there are quite a few tools to do those things. And so, you know, the, the big thing that when I think about that space is just, you know, recognizing first and foremost that AI is causing data to be a big deal, right? Because data was always sort of the last forgotten, you know, kind of part of security. But the reality is, is AI has brought it to the spotlight in the forefront very quickly because AI uses data. AI generates value and, you know, money for the business oftentimes using data. Um, it could leak or disclose data. Um, it, it accesses data in real time. It's trained on data. I mean, there's so many different aspects of of, uh, of AI that are driven by data. And so it's really important to recognize, one, the importance, and, and then two, the potential risks of doing that. There's benefits and there's upsides, but there's also risks. And um, so that's that's sort of the big thing. And then there's a, there's a lot of tools um, that are available in the marketplace. Uh, most of them from Microsoft are under the purview uh, brand name mm -hmm. that can help you with discovering your data, organizing it, tagging it, classifying it, so that you know those AI tools then have the access controls to sort of respect it. Um, 
And you know, uh, for those for those of you that remember uh, uh, Delve Office 365 Delve, yes. I think it was called. Mm -hmm. There's sort of this interesting dynamic that when that was turned on by default, you know, all of a sudden everybody was like, "Hey, everybody can see all of these files. Who well, access what files and all?" Yeah, but <laughs> they had access to them before. Yes. It's just that they couldn't easily discover them, and it yeah. wasn't being put in front of their face, mm. right? And so it was, a, it was a discovery problem that Delve exposed. Uh, but uh, it was, I'm sorry, it was an underlying access control problem. Mm -hmm. And it was just the discovery mechanism of Delve that showed you that. Mm -hmm. And so there's like these, you know, organizations really kind of chose one of two things that experienced this. One is they turned off Delve and pretended they didn't have an access problem, <laughs> in which yes. case they're behind the curve today. Yeah. Um, or they went ahead and started working on that very complex access control problem. And so that's that's really sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're facing that with AI because we can't just turn off an office feature today, right? Mm -hmm. And so the reality is, is AI is this power business value generator and so you can't turn it off and so you have to address those underlying access control problems so that that tends to be one of the sort of job ones um, within the uh, within the space of uh, of adopting AI because you want to make sure that you know if if you're asking the AI to respect your access controls and you know pass it through you actually have to have the access controls in the first place for yeah. it to do so. Otherwise, it's just going to allow anyone to see any of that data. And that's definitely not a good thing because there's a lot of things that, you know, payroll and acquisition information and whatnot that should not be widely available within the organization. In fact, there's some regulations against it. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the, the key thing there is just recognizing that that is a big space and it's something that we're going to be continuously learning on and continuously getting better at. That's great. I think... Uh is there any other questions we missed out? I think that's pretty much I it, right? I think those are the big ones that I remember, yeah. Yes, okay. That's great. Uh, so I think that uh, that brings uh, the end of our conversation. I hope you like our... Uh, a kind of a brief of what conversations we had. If you have any follow-up questions, you can definitely uh, reach out to Mark Samos. He's he's uh, on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. he he kind of posts those important slides which can help you to articulate your vision clearly. So please follow him as well uh, on LinkedIn and uh, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. So you can uh, follow and uh, have some subsequent conversations based on whatever uh, what you have. Uh, listen and that being said thank you so much mark for providing some not only uh, co-presenting but providing some insights of uh, our uh, reflection on this uh, uh, session awesome thank you thank you have a great one you too